how do biologists think about and organize biodiversity as it pertains to evolutionary history? Biologists have long appreciated the amount of biological diversity on Earth, but with over 8 million species of plants and animals, how do biologists classify and study Earth's enormous diversity? One approach is to classify species according to their evolutionary history, which is depicted in a graphical form as a phylogenetic tree. A phylogeny is a hypothesis of evolutionary history. We can reorder our species of interest here at the top of the slide, and we draw graphical representations of shared evolutionary history, which will be based on shared morphological or molecular traits that are not found in other species. For example, we can draw what is called a clay to illustrate that the pineapples and coconuts are each other's closest relatives. This is not simply a guess. We have strong evidence of this relationship because they share many morphological traits, such as the ability to photosynthesize, cells composed of cell walls, chloroplasts, and vacuoles, as well as flowers, fruits, and a long list of other morphological traits, not to mention the many shared molecular traits. The other species do not have these traits, and that's probably because they do not share as much evolutionary history. Implicit in grouping these two species is that they share these traits because they share a common ancestor, and we can even indicate these characters on the branch below these nodes. This most recent common ancestor is represented by a node, which indicates the speciation event that separated the two lineages. In this example, we hypothesize that the ancestor of the pineapples and the coconuts evolved shared traits like flowers, and that they passed them down to its descendant species. This makes more sense than hypothesizing that pineapples and coconuts independently evolved such a long list of shared traits. Next, we can group the cat and the cow together. They also share many traits that are not found in other organisms, like hair and mammary glands, which we can represent here in the phylogeny. Because they exclusively share a node, we say that they are sister species. We can easily group the snail and octopus as sister species. Both being mollusks, they have the shared traits of mantles and radula, and we can again represent the most recent common ancestor here with the node. So now we have made three sister pairs, but what about the chicken? How should we group the chicken? The answer lies in its traits. The chicken has unique traits in our example, such as feathers and hollow bones, but does it have traits that it shares with other organisms? It certainly does. Like the cow and the cat, it has four limbs making it a tetrapod as well as vertebrae. These traits are derived as they are not found in any other species in the phylogeny, including ancestral species. How do we connect the chicken to the phylogeny? Is it more closely related to the cow or to the cat? The traits that the chicken shares with the cow are the same traits that it shares with the cat. Therefore, it is equally related to both the cow and the cat. We can now draw a clade connecting the chicken to a sister cat and cow clade, again indicating that they once shared an ancestor with a node. We now have three clades, but are there any other connections that we can make? The mollusk clade and the chicken-cow-cat clade are both animals, meaning that they have shared traits such as mobility, a heterotrophic lifestyle, and other cellular traits. As before, we can draw a clade connecting the two clades, noting that the organisms in each respective clade is equally related to one another. For example, the octopus is equally related to the chicken, cow, and the cat. It looks like we are left with two clades, an animal and a plant clade, but did they ever share a most con recent common ancestor? If they did, there should be some evidence left behind. If we look at the cellular level, traits begin to emerge. Plants and animals are both eukaryotes. Their cells have nuclei that are enclosed in a membrane, and they contain other membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria, which separate them from other groups like bacteria. This evidence of shared ancestry allows us to connect our last two clades together. 
We now have a complete phylogeny, which represents the evolutionary history of organisms that we have depicted here. Now, a couple notes about how to read this phylogeny. Phylogeny should always be read from the bottom to the tips. Because we have built our tree while considering past speciation events, there is a time element where the bottom node, which is referred to as the root node, is the oldest event, and we approach the present as we move towards the tips. We can use the phylogeny to navigate through evolutionary history. We can see that the ancestor of cats split from the plants before it split from the mollusk glange. We can conclude that the reason that a cat looks more like a chicken than an octopus is that it shared a longer evolutionary history with the chicken than it did with the octopus. Another common misinformation interpretation of the phylogeny is that the most recent common ancestor looked like their tip species when they existed. It is true that ancestors shared many characteristics with their descendant species, but the most recent common ancestor of the cat and the cow did not look like a combination between the two animals. This is because when the ancestor of the cat and the cow were around, there were no such things as cat and cows. They evolved much later in time and have their own unique and derived traits. To convince yourself of this, consider whether an organism could exist that was half octopus and half coconut. The other most common way phylogenies are misinterpreted is that instead of reading the phylogeny from the root nodes upward, the linear order of species at the tips are interpreted as depicting relationships. The order of species at the tip of phylogenies contain no information about relationships. Rather, they are arranged only out of convenience and aesthetics. This point cannot be emphasized enough. The arrangement of tips do not tell us that the cow is more closely related to the chicken. Rather, nodes provide this information. Biologists refer to species relationships based on evolutionary history, where species that share a recent node are more closely related to each other than species that differ by two nodes. This is why the pineapple is more closely related to the coconut than the cat, even though it sits next to both at the tips of the phylogeny. Likewise, you should convince yourself that the octopus is more closely related to the snail, which it shares a recent node with, than the chicken which is two nodes away. Another way to visualize this difference is simply by rotating the nodes. Since the tip arrangements do not contain information on relationships, we can simply rotate each node. Let's look at our chicken for an example. When we built the phylogeny, we said that because the chicken shared traits that are found in both the cow and the cat, that it is equally related to both. Another way we can say this is that its closest relative is the most recent common ancestor to the cow and the chicken, which later gave rise to both species. Reading the phylogeny from the root to the tips, we see that the sister clay to the chicken is the cat and the cow. Now, when we look at the tips, we see that the chicken is next to the cow, but this is drawn this way because we have to arrange the chicken, cow, and the cat some way in the phylogeny. We can rotate the cow and cat clade and see that the relationships have not changed at all, only those tip arrangements. In your mind or on a the extra piece of paper, go ahead and rotate the mollusk clay, the plant clay, and the other two nodes of the phylogeny to convince yourself that the tip order does not tell us about relationships, only the nodes tell us that information.